good to have you here with us. Baptism Saturday evening. Such a joy to be here with you. Let's worship Jesus in this place. Amen. Here and now the prison shake and we're free from all our shame. At the cross, you paid it all. Broke these chains, you want it all. It's the sound of voices in surrender. It's the sound of voices in worship. Oh, something changes when we praise. Something changes when we say His name. Changes when we say Jesus, Jesus. Come on, put your hands together. Hear the sound of breakthrough now. Heaven touches earth. Every captive now may free. Every Voices in surrender. 
deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve. So I could live in the freedom you died for. And now my life is yours, and I will sing of your goodness forevermore. Worthy is your name.
You are worthy, God. We honor you. <clears throat> we praise you and worship you here this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I'm Pastor Jimmy Nyman. I just want to welcome all of you here tonight. We're going to continue our worship experience tonight with a baptism service. And in baptism, baptized just means to be immersed. Baptism in water is one of the first steps of followership and obedience to Jesus that a believer in Jesus Christ makes when they say yes to God. And what they're doing when they go into the water is they're simply, the Bible says it this way, when a person's baptized, it's simply the answer of a good conscience toward God. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ here today, one of the ways you have a good conscience toward God is by simply honoring him in baptism. It's where we go public with our faith. When they go underwater, they're identifying with Christ in his death. When they come out of the water, they're identifying with Christ in his resurrection. That's why they wear those t-shirts that say raised to life. One thing that's really important that you know that when you're, if some of you came here today to celebrate this and support them and those who are in the church, when they come, when they go in and out of the water, they're not in any way saying that they are perfect. They're simply saying they're trying to follow God. They're trying to follow Jesus Christ and his ways. And they're, because of this public admission what a followership, they're saying, hey, you, you reserve the right to speak into my life and help me to grow. Not to judge them, but to call them on to the very desire of what they want to be in Christ. Now, what you're going to observe up here is the pastor in the water is going to ask the, the person that's being baptized, do you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life? If so, please say Jesus is Lord. They'll say Jesus is Lord. They'll say, upon your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, in the name of the Holy Spirit. They'll go under the water and they'll come out. When they come out of that water, that will be a great time for you to shout, to cheer, and to celebrate them as they follow Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's continue our worship. The Lord is my Father and my Savior. He took me out of my country and freed me from people who wanted to hurt our family. He has given me new friends and made my family safe. I want to be baptized because something in my heart tells me to be baptized and I believe that it is God. I want to publicly demonstrate that I am a child of God. has saved me from death. He is a very good and very real God, the only one that exists. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for me. I want to be baptized because I repent of my sins and want to live my life for Jesus Christ. Jesus died for me, so I want to get baptized to show that I love him. I'm getting baptized today because I want to publicly dedicate my life to Jesus.
so good. We're gonna go back into just a short time of worship and then we'll keep going with the service. I invite you to stand again. Jesus, holy is the Lord. God, you are worthy of us giving our lives to you, of us dedicating ourselves to you, mind, body, soul, all of us giving ourselves and declaring it publicly. Oh, Jesus, we say you're worthy. Worthy you are, worthy you are. of our adoration of all that we could ever bring. We love you, Jesus. We celebrate those who today have decided to publicly declare you are their Lord. It's such a joyous occasion and we know that the angels in heaven, they raise up a mighty sound of thanksgiving. They are excited too, they are excited with us. As we cheer on these people, we know that heaven rejoices as well. God, thank you for your heart that you desire to have a divine partnership with us. It's so beyond our wildest imaginations. But we know, we believe you want to walk this life with us and we bring you praise for that. Thank you that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Amen. Hey, welcome to Lifeway Church. It's so good to have y'all here with us tonight. Thank you for coming. Thanks for celebrating with those who got baptized. It's just... It's so fun to be in a room of believers celebrating others. Here at Lifeway, we exist so that you would know Christ, experience connection, discover your purpose, and go and impact lives for eternity. You can take a seat. We have some announcements for you. Thanks, everybody. Hello, and welcome to Lifeway Church. One of the easiest ways to get connected with us is by downloading the Church Center app. Once you pick Lifeway as your church and get signed in, it allows you to give, sign up for a group, pre-check your kids into children's ministry, and register for events such as baptism, core, or discovery pathway. If you're new or you're taking a next step in your relationship with God, tap the Connect card link. First time guests joining us in person are welcome to stop by the Welcome Center for some sweets and a Lifeway mug. Here at Lifeway, we're committed to doing life together. So if you have prayer requests or praise reports that you'd like to share with us, tap here to fill out a prayer and praise card. We love getting connected and hearing how God is moving in your lives. 
Speaking of connection, life groups meet throughout the year and cover a range of topics, interests, and stages of life. To find a group where you can make friends and get plugged in, select the Groups tab. If you happen to miss place of belonging and were looking for its return, check the Lost and Found located at the Welcome Center. Lost items will only be held for two months, so be sure to check it out. Interested in giving a donation to LifeWay? We have a number of options for you. Cash and check donations can go in an offering envelope. Please make checks payable to LifeWay Church. You can give online by simply tapping the Give tab to get started, or by texting a dollar amount to the number 84321. We call that text to give. There's also the Give button on our website if you prefer. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of the service. October is Pastor Appreciation Month, and we want to encourage you to take some time to bless them for all the care and kindness they pour out to us. Starting next week and through the month of October, we will have kiosks located in the lobby for your convenience, where you can drop a note of encouragement or even give financially to one or all of our pastors as you feel led. Take some time to ask God how you can bless them. Good evening, LifeWay Church. Good to have you here, and I can't really think of anything I would rather do on a Saturday night than be here with you worshiping the Lord and watching people get baptized. It's been a long time since I've been baptized, but it is as precious to me now as it was then, the summer before I went into sixth grade. God did a work in my heart then, and he continues it to this very day, and I want that to be part of your story too. Hey, we're kicking off a new series today, and it's called, you got this, it's a complicated title, it's called Romans, all right? But we've got a subtitle for you, Real Questions, Real Answers. Now, I'll get to that in just a minute, but I want to make sure we all know what we're talking about when we talk about the book of Romans, one of the books that we find in the New Testament, which is the second half of our Bible. Now, growing up, my dad was a deep thinker and a philosopher, and he loved the book of Romans. I heard him, if I heard him say it once, I heard him say it a million times, oh honey, Romans is my favorite book of the Bible. And uh, he's been in the hospital a couple of times in the last month, and um, two weeks ago I was sitting there by his bedside, and we didn't, we didn't know yet um, how things were going to turn out. And uh, you know, what do you talk about in a moment like that, right? And I looked at him and I said, Dad, I get to preach on Romans in a couple of weeks. I said, how about if I run my main points of my sermon by you? And so I gave him a quick rundown of the direction I was going to go. And he said, oh, honey, he said, now you're speaking my language. And so it's a privilege for me to kick off our Roman series. Now, I memorized the entire book of Romans as a teenager when I was in Bible quizzing. And I'll be honest with you, I really had no idea what it meant. I thought it was deep and confusing, and it was meant for people like my dad, who were deep thinkers and could actually understand it. And so that's why we're calling this series Real Questions and Real Answers, because I'm encouraging you to read through the book of Romans over the next couple of weeks, and you will have questions. We've done our best to anticipate what those questions might be so that we can help answer some of them for you. Now, the book of Romans is actually a letter, a very long letter. In our days of texting, we have completely lost the art of letter writing, and um, uh, it was written by a man named Paul. Now, Paul was uh, a, a very religious man. And some of you might say that a, a religious person is a Christian, not necessarily. See, Paul was a Pharisee. He was very zealous for the things of the Lord, but he had gotten completely off track. In fact, Paul was one of those who began persecuting Christians, actually rounding them up, throwing them in jail, and sometimes... Sometimes he was there attending at their deaths. And so what happens in the life of Paul is he has a radical encounter with Jesus. You can read about that in the book of Acts, which comes just a little bit before Romans. And as a result of that, he is compelled 
to go tell other people about Jesus Christ. And he begins traveling, he begins planting churches, the first church planting network, and and then he goes and he visits the churches so he can encourage them in the Lord. Romans was one of those churches that he hadn't been to yet, and so he writes this letter in advance, and it's almost like he was like, the gospel is so exciting, I got to tell you all about it because I don't think I can stand to wait until I actually get there. Some of Paul's letters were written to individual people, like Timothy or Titus, but this one was a a letter written corporately to a group of people in Rome. Of all the books in the Bible, the book of Romans probably best encapsulates the entire gospel message of Jesus Christ. Now, our real question for week number one is this, why is the gospel good news? And some of you might be saying, I don't even know what what gospel means. What is that word? And so in in the original language, and and you don't need to remember this, but we're going to come back to this in a minute, which is why I'm telling you, it's the word euangelion, which means gospel, which is interpreted good news. So when people talk about the gospel being good news, it's because the gospel literally means good news. It's the same root word. Uh, for the word evangelism. Well, what's evangelism? It's simply telling people about the good news. And so that's what we're going to unpack tonight. Some versions of the Bible use the word gospel. Other versions of the Bible use the phrase good news. Same thing. It doesn't matter what your version chooses. Now, at the end of every message here at Lifeway, the end of every service, we preach the gospel message and we give people a chance to respond to it. I'm gonna preach the gospel message right up front. In fact, the gospel message, my entire sermon is really the gospel message. And, and so I, I, it's really this simple. God sent his son Jesus to earth to die for you. He died for your sins so you would not have to. As a result of that, you can receive his forgiveness and become part of his family. Now there are certain benefits that come along with that. Here on earth, as his child, you experience his peace and his joy and his love and his protection and his provision, but he also promises you that you will live with him in eternity in heaven where there will be no sadness, no sickness, and no sorrow ever, ever again. That's the gospel message in a nutshell right there. Now, what's your job? Your job is simply to believe it, receive it, confess it, confess and repent of anything that maybe you've been doing that has not been pleasing to the Lord, and receive the new person that he wants to make you to be. So here's the bottom line. If I could could summarize the gospel message in one line, it would be this. Jesus did the hard stuff so you could get to the good stuff. There we go. That's it. That's the gospel message. Jesus did the hard stuff so you could get to the good stuff. And we're going to talk today about what exactly is that good stuff that he's prepared for you. So I'm going to read to you a selection of verses from the first chapter of Romans, kicking it off today. The version I'm using uses the phrase good news, but again, some versions will say gospel. And I want you to see if you can count how many times you hear me say good news in this reading of scripture. Paul starts out the letter differently than we do. We usually end a letter by saying, you know, like, love, Renee. Paul approaches it more like we do when we text somebody and we're not sure that our number is in their phone. And so we start off saying, like, hey, this is Renee, so they know, right? And they don't just automatically delete you. So this is how Paul starts. He says, this letter is from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. God promised this good news long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The good news is about his son. In his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line and he was shown to be the son of God. When he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit, he is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ, God has given us the privilege and authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them so that they will believe and obey him, bringing glory to his name. And you are included among those Gentiles who've been called 
to belong to Jesus Christ. I'm writing to all of you in Rome who are loved by God and who are called to be his own holy people. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Then Paul spends a couple of verses saying, listen, I've been hearing about y'all. I've been hearing good stuff, and I'm so excited about what God's doing. I'm praying for you day and night. I want to come visit you so desperately. In fact, I've made plans several times, and they keep getting hijacked. But it is my goal to get to you eventually. And then we pick it up again in verse 15. He says, so I am eager to come to you in Rome, too, to preach the good news, for I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it's through faith that a righteous person has life. Now, I want you to rewind a little bit go a couple of decades before this happens, and think about Christmas. Think about when Jesus was born, the Jesus that the Apostle Paul is now serving as Lord in Christ. If you'll remember, there were shepherds. They were out on a hill at night watching their sheep when an angel appears to tell them the the good news about the arrival of Jesus. And I want you to listen to what the angel says. The angel said to them, this is Luke 2.10, do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Guess what? That phrase, good news, the exact same word for gospel, euangelion, same word in the original language. The angel comes and tells him in advance, this is what's going to happen. It's going to be amazing. I'm telling you, the gospel, the good news has come to you. And now here we are, years later, the Apostle Paul is continuing to spread the good news about Christ. Now, the angel says this is good news for all the people. Who are all the people? Who is the angel talking to? I mean, was it just for them? Was it just for the shepherds? I want to tell you right now, when he says it's for all the people, it means all the people. That includes us. That includes me. That includes you. This this was not just good news for the shepherds. This is good news for us right here in 2022. Now listen, a couple of things can happen. Sometimes, depending on your faith tradition, you could have been raised in a church that maybe taught some wrong thinking about the gospel or about the good news. So I'm speaking to you tonight because I want to make sure you understand what it really, really means when we say the gospel is good news. On the other hand, if you're new to Christ and you're like, I haven't even been in church very long, I really have no idea what you're talking about. I want you to understand the good news for the first time in your life. So no matter where you are in your journey with Jesus, this good news is good news for all the people. It wasn't just good news the day the angel announced it. You know, I think about things in my past. You know, I remember when we bought our house and the real estate agent called me and said, hey, good news, you got the house. It's still good news. I mean, we don't celebrate it on a daily basis, but it's still good news. I remember 37 years ago at the Overlook Roller Rink in Lancaster when a mutual friend came up to me and said, hey, Gary Groff is interested in you. I think he's going to ask you out. It was good news. Listen, listen. 37 years later, it's still good news. He's still interested in me, okay? So just because you've moved past maybe the very first time you heard about Jesus, it is still good news for you on a daily basis. And I I want you to grab hold of that tonight in your life. Now, I'm going to talk to you about who are all the people. I'm going to tell you about four kinds of people that the angel came to share the good news with. And I want you to see where you fit into this puzzle. And there is some overlap. You can't get away from that. But I'm excited to unpack it with you. And the first one is this. The gospel is good news for those who are striving. The gospel is good news for those who are striving. That word striving means trying. And I'm guessing most of you in this room would qualify as trying to be good people. 
I'm guessing that that defines most of you. You're not actively plotting and planning some offense or crime against humanity. And it is likely hard for you to wrap your mind around the idea that God would send good people to hell. Hell seems like overkill for somebody that might just slip up a little bit now and then. Have you thought these thoughts before? Because I have. Here's the truth. We have deeply underestimated our sin problem. It goes far beyond what we see in the natural. I mean, when I read the news, guys, uh, I mean, I am, I am sickened by the things that I see. When I see about children being raped and molested, and I read about human trafficking, and I read about atrocious things that are happening between races, it grieves my heart. But these are not the only ways we can sin. We have a sin problem on the inside. All of those things we see manifesting out here, they started in here. They started with wrong desires, wrong motivations, wrong attitudes, and that leads then toward brokenness on the outside. Romans 3.23 says this, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So it, why is the gospel good news for all people? Because all people have sinned including me and including you. Sin is not just being committed by a, a few, you know, a few ruffians around the world, by a few people that we read about on the news. The, the truth is when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, earth as we know it, humanity as God originally created it was corrupted in that moment. And at that moment, death and disease entered into our physical bodies. The earth began to decay. And we began to see people doing atrocious things to one another, starting out in the very beginning of scripture, when one brother kills another. And those things are still happening today. So here's where our thinking gets off track. We assume that we are good people living in a good world. It's just not true. The world is broken and the world is fallen. And we should not be surprised at the things we hear and read and see on the news. Because what else would you expect from a broken world? What else would you expect? It's more shocking, actually, it is more shocking that we see good things come forth that we sometimes see beauty and life and light in the midst of a very broken and fallen world. I, I'm getting to the good part in just a second. Hang with me, I promise. I know, it's, I know it's getting heavy. We talk about being a good person, but the truth is, sin separates us so far from God, you could not possibly do enough good works to bridge that gap. Just not possible. I don't care if you were doing good deeds all day long for the rest of your life, never gonna bridge the gap, never gonna get you closer to Jesus. We have no power to save ourselves, guys. We have no power to save ourselves. It is simply a work of God, his grace that saves us and rescues us. You can't fix the problem, you can't fix your, yourself, you can't fix the world, but oh brother, he can, he can. And that's the good news of the gospel. Because your righteousness has never been based on what you bring to the table. It has always been based on what Jesus did for you. It is just that simple. It's really not possible to be a good person without Jesus. It's just not possible. But when he comes into your heart, when he transforms your life, well then, I mean then anything's possible. Because the power of God is at work within you to bring transformation. So if you can't earn your way to heaven by doing good works, then you need a different motivation for doing them. Doesn't mean you shouldn't. It means you need a different motivation. Your motivation isn't to try and bridge the gap, to try and impress God, to try and earn your way to heaven. So what should your motivation be? Well, here it is. You don't do good works to earn his love. It's because of his love that you now feel inspired to do good works. 
flip it. You got to flip the way you think. Guys, I have to remind myself of this on a regular basis because I get off track. And sometimes I find myself going through the day and I'm just trying to be a good person on my own and falling short. And the truth is, it is because of the power of Christ in me that I can share his love and I can spread the good news of the gospel to other people. So who are some more of those people, all the people that the angel announced the good news to? Well, the gospel is also good news for those who are sinning. Listen, I don't care who you are. Our tendency is to compare our sin to somebody else's and then measure ourselves accordingly. When I was a teenager, I had two best friends. One was five feet tall and one was six feet tall. They looked really odd together if I wasn't hanging out with them, let me tell you. I was kind of there in the middle to smooth things over. Listen, when I was with the five foot tall friend, I felt enormous and giant and awkward. And when I was with the six foot tall friend, man, I just, I felt little and petite. Which one was it? Neither was an accurate assessment because it was all based on who I was measuring myself against. And we got to stop looking at the the grievous sins that we see other people committing and thinking, thank God I'm not like that. Because our hearts without Christ are equally depraved, let me tell you. Without Christ, they are. Ephesians 2.13, this is what I referenced earlier. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's what he does for you. Now, Lisa Harper is one of my favorite speakers, and one of her lines is, if sin wasn't such a big deal, God could have just handled it with a detention or a timeout. Sin was a big deal. And what God did is he co-opted the Old Testament understanding for the need for a blood sacrifice to cover up for the sins of the people. Listen, if Jesus hadn't died for your sins, you would have to do it. Do you understand the reality of that? He did it so you do not have to. That alone is good news right there. In the Old Testament, they frequently would, and when I say frequently, I mean frequently, the priests would sacrifice animals on the altar to try to atone for the sins of the people, but it was always just temporary. When Jesus came and died on the cross for sinners of which we all are or were before we came to know Christ, he said, I'm gonna take care of this once and for all. I'm gonna die one time, a blood sacrifice, and it's gonna cover the sins of all mankind for all time. And that includes us. That includes us. Now, here's the thing. When we say the gospel's good news for those who are, who are sinning, it is twofold. The first part is pretty easy for us to get. You don't have to pay the punishment for your own sin. Yep, got it, good, check. Here's the second part. The gospel is good news because it also means you don't have to keep on sinning. And that should mean something to you. That should mean something to you. I'll draw your attention to a story in Luke 19, the story of Zacchaeus. And he was a tax collector. They were not super popular. They were known for charging more taxes than they should, skimming money off the top. And Zacchaeus gets wind that Jesus is coming to town. Now, Zacchaeus is short of stature. And so the Bible tells us that he runs ahead of the crowd and he jumps up in a sycamore tree. Never really got that until just a couple weeks ago, Gary and I had dinner at Rick and Lisa Stennett's house. What do they have in their backyard? A sycamore tree right here in Lebanon. And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't stop looking at it and thinking, I get it. I get it. I always wondered, how could this little guy climb up in this big, big tree? You know, lots of trees, you can't even get to a branch until you're like 40 feet up in the air. I'm like, I don't know how he pulled this off. But the sycamore tree had these wonderful low-lying branches that were sturdy and steady, and they ran, they, they ran uh, horizontal uh, to the ground, and, and they were just a little bit higher than your head. And so honestly, a whole row of people could sit up there and watch Jesus coming. That's where Zacchaeus went. Now, I heard somebody tell a cute little story about their niece one time, and she said her niece was telling the story of Zacchaeus, and she couldn't say the word sycamore. She got a little bit mixed up, 
And what she said was, Zacchaeus climbed up in a sick of me tree. (laughs) Guys, I think the little girl had it right. I think she's the one that got it right. Because we all have to have a moment where we say, I'm just sick of me. I'm just sick of the way I'm living. I'm sick of the way I'm thinking. I'm sick of the way I'm relating to people. I'm just sick of me. And we climb up and we say, Where, where's Jesus? Because I need him. I need somebody to rescue me from me. And what happens in our hearts in that moment is it, is it no longer is about, oh shoot, I have to stop sinning. Now it becomes life-giving. The truth is, guess what? I don't have to keep on sinning. I can leave that life behind me because now I'm a whole new person in Christ Jesus. Some of you just think it's too late or it's too messy. There's there's too much work to be done, but it's just not true. Here's the thing. Have you climbed out of your sick of me tree yet? Because that's what Zacchaeus did and that's what made the difference. Jesus came along and he sees him and he says, hey, why don't you come down? I'm coming to your house for dinner today. And without hesitation, he hops out of that tree Jesus comes to his house and he's a changed man. Here's what Zacchaeus says. He says, I'm gonna give half of everything I own to the poor and I'm gonna pay back everyone I've cheated four times the amount I took from them. Now, Jesus didn't give him a checklist. Jesus didn't say, look, Zacchaeus, like if you wanna be one of my people, here's what you're gonna have to do. No, Zacchaeus invites Jesus into his life. He invites Jesus' presence and influence. And as a result, Zacchaeus is the one who is empowered and inspired to make these changes in his life. And the same is true for you. It can be true for you. Our tendency is to think about what we might have to give up. And so we stay up in the sick of me tree because we know if we climb down, ah, am I gonna have to give up friends? Am I going to have to give up some money? Am I going to have to give up some of my time? And so we just keep hanging out in the tree, just looking for Jesus. Well, I'm just, I'm just waiting for a word from the Lord. Oh, you had a word from the Lord. He said, come down, come down, come down. And invite me into your home, into your heart. And I will give you the desire to live differently. And I will then empower you to actually do it. This is the good news for those of us who struggle with sin. It's not about what you'll have to give up if you it's not about what you'll have to give up if you follow Jesus. It's about what you will have to give up if you do not. Flip the switch. Flip the switch. Now, some of you in this room might be going through some challenging times and you're like, this all sounds great so far, Renee, but man, if you knew the stuff I was facing in my life, It's just not that easy. I'm here to tell you, the gospel is good news for those who are struggling. And we are all struggling in some way or another. It might look different in your life than it does in mine, but we all have struggles that we face. I mean, life is just full of bad news if that's where we wanna dwell. And our tendency can begin to think, How could a good God allow so much pain and suffering? Now listen, the good news of the gospel for those who are struggling is this. There's good news for you now, but there's also good news for you later. And I love that. Too many times when people come to know Christ, it's simply they want to get into heaven. They want the good later. But there is good now for those of us who are struggling Looping back to what I said before, when sin entered the earth, then we were all born into it. All of mankind was. And and the thing is, it's not just Adam and Eve's fault. It's our fault too, because we have perpetuated the sin that says, I don't believe what God said. I don't think he really meant it. And I want to live life on my own terms. My little nephew just got in trouble. Uh, I'll keep him anonymous. Uh, But he's seven years old and he just got in trouble Uh, for defying something that his parents said not to do. Well, guess what his excuse was when when they called him out? He blamed the neighbor girl. He said, Ellie made me do it. And I thought to myself, the gap between the Garden of Eden 
and 2022 is not that far, we are still in the business of blaming other people for our own mess. It should actually be more shocking to us that God sees fit to break into the corruption that we brought on ourselves. And he still brings blessing and goodness and healing and life and love in the midst of it. He could have left us here alone to wallow in our misery. He could have said, you made your bed, now lie in it. You fix your own problem. But he made it possible for us to experience glimmers of love and hope and life here on earth. Psalm 27, 13, the psalmist says this, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Not all the good stuff saved up for heaven. Some of it is for right here and right now. That's good news for those of you that are struggling today. But listen, even better, if you know Jesus as your personal savior, then you know this is not it. This is not the end game. This is not the grand finale. There is a very bright light at the end of the tunnel and his name is Jesus. I used to wonder as a child why older people could be at peace with dying. And now as I'm getting older, I get it. Because you get to the place where you have as many loved ones there as you have here. And so you can't wait to be reunited with them. Gary's father passed away when we were in our late 20s. He was diagnosed with a brain tumor at the age of 51, and he struggled, suffered, and I do mean suffered for four long years before he passed away at the age of 55. He, uh, because of the, the location of the brain tumor, he had lost his ability to speak, and so we could not communicate with him for most of those four years. He was unable to hold conversation, and for an extrovert, that was difficult very difficult for him. But he also lost the use of the right side of his body, so he couldn't even use his right hand. He was right-handed, couldn't even use his right hand to write notes to communicate with us. Guys, here's what happened when he passed away. He was sitting in bed, in his hospital bed, in their home, and just before he drew his last breath, he smiled. He sat up, And he reached up the hand that had not worked for four years. Guys, you know, you know as well as I do who he was reaching for. He saw Jesus on the other side. That can be the reality for every single one of us. We don't have to fear death. Honestly, we talk about it a lot in our family. He never got a chance to meet our kids. He passed away before either of them was born. And I'm like, ah, oh, some different times they'll say, I can't wait to meet Grandpa Mel. And I'm like, oh, he is gonna love you. Like he would just enjoy you. Guess what? He's still going to someday. I'm so grateful for that hope. Even when my dad was in the hospital the other week and we just weren't sure what was gonna happen, I was still at peace because I will see him again someday, even when he's no longer here with me. Revelation says this about heaven. It says, he, God, will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All of these things are gone forever. Listen, it's a temporary separation that precedes a permanent celebration. It's gonna be good stuff, guys. I promise it is. And that is good news. When you are in moments here on earth where you are struggling and life seems hard, it's not a death wish, but sometimes I say to the Lord, I'm so glad this isn't it. I'm so glad I'm not here forever because some days it is hard. I'm grateful for the reward that is promised. And, you know, the Bible talks about there being a crowd of witnesses that are cheering us on from heaven And I'm telling you right now, you got a crowd of witnesses cheering you on right here at Lifeway Church. I remember when my paternal grandmother passed away, we knew she was near the end. And uh, it was very early in the morning of her death. I had not gotten word yet that she died. And the Lord gave me a vision of her entering heaven. Now, Grandma, she, she had a twinkle in her eye. She was just silly and fun. 
We always joked that she looked a little bit like Humpty Dumpty because she had a round little body and these skinny little arms and legs and we never understood how they held her up. I'm just being honest. <laughs> but in the vision, the Lord showed me my grandma hobbling up a hill in her little Humpty Dumpty body. And there was a crowd of witnesses. I couldn't see them, but I could hear them in the vision. And I heard one of them say, oh, look, here comes Martha. They were waiting for her entrance. They were celebrating it. Guys, we can't be sad when we lose people that love Jesus because that's what they've got waiting for them. And that's what you can have waiting for you too. Someday they'll say, oh, look, here comes Renee. Here comes Renee. Here's the thing. Some of you in this room aren't sure yet where you stand on this whole Jesus thing, on the whole gospel and the good news. So here's what I have to say to you. The gospel is good news for those who are seeking. For those of you that are still trying to figure this thing out, those of you that are trying to figure out where you stand and what you want to believe. If you look at the world, whether we talk about history or, or current day, there are so many options that the world offers us. And the Old Testament, they, they dealt with this too. The idea that there were, they had a God for everything because they didn't know the one true God. And so they were knocking themselves out to try and please the God of the sun and the God of the moon and the God of fertility and the God of rain, just in hopes that perhaps the gods might smile upon them. People say Christianity is complicated. It's not, it's very simple. There is one way, there is one man. His name is Jesus and he is it. You don't have to knock yourself out trying to figure this thing out, trying to figure out who to impress or what to do. Romans 10.9 says it as clearly as I've ever read it. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Boom. It is just that simple. It is truly just that simple. See, with other religions, you have to earn your way to whatever God you choose but Romans 5.8 says this, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for you before you were born. He died for you before you ever even sinned. He already made his move in advance, in anticipation of your precious life here on this earth. Other religions are about rules. You do the right thing. You hope you check enough boxes and then maybe, just maybe, you'll get the reward, you'll get into heaven or whatever that particular religion is offering. Listen, you don't have to impress God. You don't have to try to appease God. When he died on the cross, he did the only thing that was necessary for you to get to heaven. It was never based on what you could do for him, always based on what he did for you. And now, you get to serve God because you want to and not because you have to. Listen, I was raised by some really great parents. I could spend hours telling you all the ways they have loved on me and blessed me. Like, I'm not even kidding. My dad just got out of the hospital on Wednesday. They showed up at our house yesterday with soup and cornbread and pumpkin pie because they knew I wasn't feeling great and I had to preach. I'm not, I'm not making this up. These are the kinds of parents I was blessed to have. They have helped us with our children. My dad has painted more rooms than I can begin to count. My mom has brought us meals, invited us over for meals. My dad's been in the hospital twice in the last month. Do you think ever once I thought to myself, oh, I guess I have to go visit my dad? Never once, never once. Oh, I wanted to visit my dad. I wanted to call my mom and say, hey, do you need a ride to the hospital? When you love somebody, it is your joy and your privilege to serve them with your entire life. If that kind of relationship can exist 
between me and my parents. It can surely exist between you and the God who loves you enough to send his son to die for you. Christianity is the only religion with an empty tomb. All the other gods, they're dead. But Jesus came back to life and the word's very clear that the same power that raised him from the dead can live inside of you. What in the world is possible for your life if the resurrection power of Jesus Christ lives right here? Oh, the possibilities for you are endless. You can't even dream big enough to imagine what God has planned for your life if you will just give it to him and say, I'm in. I'm in. I'd ask you to stand to your feet. I said at the beginning, the bottom line is, Jesus did the hard stuff so you could get to the good stuff. Today is your chance to say, I want in on the good stuff. You know, there's a verse in John 14 too that it says, a, a lot of versions say, in my father's house, this is Jesus talking about heaven, in my father's house are many mansions and I'm gonna go prepare a place for you. It's not a really great interpretation because we get this idea that, wow, I wanna get to heaven so I can be in this fancy schmancy mansion all by myself, it's gonna be awesome. No, 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 no. He's saying there are many dwelling places and I've got a room that I'm preparing just for you. You're being invited in to a family where you're gonna be surrounded by other people who are cheering you on. I want you to get in on that. Would you close your eyes, please? If you were in this room today and you would say, I'm in that last category, Renee. I'm one of those who is seeking. I'm telling you, there is an expiration date on this invitation. It's either your death or Christ's return whichever comes first. So I'm begging you not to delay. Make today the day of your salvation where you embrace the good news of the gospel. If that is you today, I'm asking, do you just raise your hand? Say, I want it, I want in. Thank you, I see you. Anybody else? I want in. Jesus, Jesus. All right, you can put your hands down. How about the rest of you? If you're in this room and you say, hey, Renee, I'm in the other categories. I'm striving, I'm sinning, I'm struggling. I, I need to be reminded of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If that's you today, would you raise your hand as well? Yeah, lots of you today, lots of you. Me too, me too. Let's make this declaration together. Would you repeat after me? God, thank you for doing the hard stuff so I could get to the good stuff. Today I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and I believe in my heart that you rose from the dead and now my life is forever changed. I declare that you did everything that was necessary for me to be saved. I declare that I no longer need to sin because you've given me a clean slate and a clean heart. I declare that you are with me in my struggles and that I have a forever home as part of your family. And I declare that my search is over because I have found you the savior of my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. If you raised your hand tonight to accept Jesus as Lord of your life, I encourage you to take the Connect card out of the seat in front of you, fill it out, let us know what God did tonight in your life, take it out to the Welcome Center. We want to pray for you as you embark on this journey of faith with Christ as you embrace the good news. If it's your first time here, or maybe you've been coming for a while, but you've not filled out a Connect card to introduce us to you, I would encourage you to do so. Take it out to the Welcome Center. We've got a gift for you. We're so glad you're here. You're gonna receive a letter from us 
just telling you how you can get connected here at Lifeway Church if you're interested. I love you guys. Pray the peace of Christ in your life tonight and in the days to come. Let's worship together one more time. Amen. Yeah, let's end our time together this evening singing about the good news of the gospel. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down. By heavy stone, Messiah's dead, and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name for. Oh, Lord.
you are seated in the heavenlies, already the victor. You have the victory, Jesus. Because of your death and your resurrection, we have life. Because of your victory, we have victory. We praise you in this place. We give you praise in our hearts. We give you praise with our mouths. And we say that our lives will also be worship unto you, Jesus. You're deserving of our praise. Thank you that your life, your death, your resurrection is good news, Jesus, for us. We need you so desperately. And you came and you gave yourself so abundantly. Oh, Jesus, you are more than enough. You not only bring us into your kingdom, but you invite us into friendship. You bring us healing and wholeness. You pick us up, you turn us around, you put us on a totally new path, a path of life and not death. And we say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, he has the victory, come on. Woo. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Hey, it's so good to be here with you this evening to get to celebrate people getting baptized, declaring that their lives are going to be lived for Jesus. Such a joy. Thank you for worshiping with us. Thank you, Renee, for such a powerful message. So good to see you all here. Be blessed. Have a wonderful rest of your night. Hope to see you all next week. Thanks.